Well, the weekend's come and gone. Time to get back to this reflex. I'm just going to put the base plate back on the camera now. And I'll just set my counter to number one, I think, so that the film advance locks. I don't want this to. Uh, yeah, film advance is locked, and that the film advance lever will be locked. It means that the mechanism can't unwind itself when I take the lever off. And because it can't unwind itself, that means that it can't skip off the last tooth of the rack and cause me grief having to lift the uh, meter and put everything back again, which I really don't want to do. So this was just the base plate that I put on here while I was assembling the camera. It is just the base plate from a Retina Reflex or Reflex S or quite possibly a Retina 3S camera. And as you can see, I've just chopped it off using a Dremel, I think. Okay, so here's our spring for our capping plate. Make sure that's present and correct. And I'll put the, this plate on. Now the chrome trims on this camera were in a pretty ugly state but they've cleaned up well I'm not going to put the leatherettes back on immediately that's because I might want access here to adjust the position of the mirror should it be that the reef the image in the finder does not correspond with the image at the film plane then I might need to adjust the position of the the rest position of the reflex mirror and that's done at this point so that means that the leatherettes have on, has to go on the base of the camera pretty much last of all after the prism has been put on the camera and um, the top seal and everybody's happy with the way everything looks that there are no dust inclusions that you feel you should go back in and have a look at once you're happy with the top of the camera and you close everything up you can put the leatherettes on of course I could put the leatherette on the camera back at this stage but uh, I might just as well do my leatherettes all at one go I think the camera back of course had to strip the leatherette from that because of Zeiss bumps underneath it and you can see there quite clearly there's a, some roughness there that was corrosion likewise there's a patch of roughness there and that's where corrosion has started occurring in the aluminium and uh, you just end up with that powdery alumin aluminium oxides or whatever it is that forms and of course that breaks the bond of the adhesive and everything, before you know it, you've got size bumps everywhere. Right, so that's our chrome trim back on the base plate. That's that little job out of the way. So I'm on my way out now, really. I've got to clean the finder assembly and put that back. But before I get there, I've got to adjust my meter. At the moment, it's the cord runs around the drum everything's connected all the timings correct down here at the bottom but I haven't timed the drum at the top to that mechanism so I've got to check this to see how accurate that meter is set it in the correct position loop there's a you have to loop the the cord through a notch in the back of the drum to lock it there so that the cord and the drum stay in the same relative positions and uh, only then once I've done that can I tell whether the meter is actually useful because I will set it to read accurately at one light level then I will test it to see if it reads accurately at a lower light level or a higher light level 
and um, if it reads correctly over about a four or five stop range that's probably sufficiently good for daylight use and I wouldn't bother testing any further than that but that's what I'll do so what have I got to do well I've got to set my film speed on the meter dial here for a start because at the moment it's at ASA 10 where we left it so I'll press down on that like pressing down the button and I'll set that to the customary position that I check my meters at and I'll go and check this against my uh, light source and find out how it works, how it's going and I'm most likely I'm going to have to turn this drum relative to the cord but I'll find out that all appears to be quite good there I did have to turn the drum relative to the cord of course I've got no glass on the top of this somewhat reduced housing I'm using here for my testing purposes so I was able to just stick my thumb on the top and twist that and it was good it was as it happens where I'd positioned it it was well within half a stop so it didn't need much movement to adjust it so I've got to get the cord tucked in correctly now the notch is around here what I'm going to do is mark my cord and the drum so I can see the alignment of the cord there. So I, I don't want this to the alignment to change as I'm revolving the drum. And I'm revolving the, the wheel at the bottom here. I'm, I'm turning that to bring the drum around to the point where I can see the notches. And they're just coming into view here now. I'll just tip this up, you may be able to see there are two notches here and here. That's where I've got to get the cord trapped in. Now, we've got two loops of cord over here, one above the other. Now the cord at the, in the above position, that's the one I want trapped under that notch. What I'll have to do is lift the bottom cord up over out of the way and pull the upper cord down get it into the notch at both ends and then bring the lower cord back over into position now doing this is always a bit fraught because the chances of you knocking your meter off the top of the camera effectively releasing the tension so that the cord comes off the pulleys and you'd have to pull the entire front of the camera apart again in order to put things back is fairly high so it's um, always an interesting procedure. I would say that you know, I'm pretty good at it and I'm pretty good at avoiding trouble but at least one in ten is going to bite me and uh, this could be my lucky day. Right, let the games commence. First I've got to get this lower cord up and over. So I'm using dressmakers pins freshly stolen from my wife's sewing box to lift that cord back over the top now the one that I'm seeing here now I've got to get into those two notches a lot of tension on this cord it's pretty robust stuff this is some sort of magic fishing line As you can see, I've managed to get that hooked in there neatly, and now I've just got to bring my lower cord back over into position, sitting, sitting there nicely. And now that's timed. 
and that, that's all correct and I'll put the top back on that, no I won't, I'll, I've got a couple of screws to put on the front here first then I'll put the top back in the camera while I'm considering my next move and uh, let's find those screws I really do need to clean the finder assembly next before I do much more well there's not much more to do to tell the truth finder assembly, the top cover and put the leatherettes back I've removed the bracket here that held the spring for our front uh, pinion that little cam on the front ok let's put this on here for safekeeping while I think about stripping apart this viewfinder assembly I'm weighing up that finder assembly I know it would benefit from a new prism but I don't know whether it justifies the cost new prism assemblies while I can get them they're 60 years old new so they are really perfect when I get them and um, so the chances I've got to weigh up whether the improvement of fitting a better another prism is going to be worth the cost of putting one of those prisms in place unless the finder is real if the, unless the prism is really bad often it doesn't make much difference to your viewing and it certainly and of course it makes no result difference at all to the results on film anyway our meters back in that's all happy the camera body lacks leatherettes and finder assembly and top cover. Oops, pop that to one side. Let's find this finder assembly. Perhaps it would make more sense to clean up this top cover so that it's all ready to go when I've got my finder assembly in place. Now, the major shortcoming of this top cover is clearly this meter clear window there for the meter. You can see how many cracks that's got. I mean that's that's just bits basically. It's just held in there by good luck more than anything else. And unfortunately it's gonna have to come out. There you go. That's why <laughs> if I hadn't done that it would have done it for the new for the owner as soon as they went to use it. That little plastic piece is crimped into position. You can see little crimp marks round in here where it was crimped into place. Now all of those little crimp marks of course they're going to prevent me from pushing a new window into place. So first thing I've got to do is go around here and push those little crimps back out. And as with all these things it's awkward. I'll work away at that with, I think I've got a screwdriver tip here arranged somehow that I'll, yeah, ground away that I can get to. Basically I just want something with a nice radius tip like this that I can press on. But this is a scalpel, I'm certainly don't want to be pressing on the other end of that. So how did I push those little crimps out? I used this, an old uh, table knife, and slid the knife in from underneath. So it was coming in fairly flat and I was able to push those little crimps back out of the way and I've just fitted a new window in here and I'm just about to crimp the edges back over again to hold that new window in place. And uh, of course I'll just be using a, I don't have a fancy crimp tool, I'll just be using a screwdriver, putting it in the groove there, twisting it and that'll fold that edge in and lock that into place. This usually works pretty well. 
I find my wooden block to work on so that I don't risk popping the whole thing off the top of the camera. My all-purpose block of wood has gone into hiding, so I'll just use this instead. As you can see, all I'm doing is putting my screwdriver into that groove, rotating it, pulling that fine metal edge down over the top of the plastic window. That's pretty much it. So that's firm and in place. Now there's the protective plastic on here. I'll peel that off. That leaves me with my nice clean window. This time, of course, that's um, not whatever terrible or whatever that rubbish was. This is polycarbonate sheet and it should prove to be much more durable. Not to mention better at being able to see through these things all nasty and yellow now. Right, so that's that part of the top cover done. I want to just clean the edges now and clean the finder. Make sure that the frame counter works smoothly and then I'll be in business. The edges of this show a little bit of grime I'm not sure what that is. It's even possible that that's um, pollen. So I'll just use some naphtha on a cotton bud. And that, those marks on the edge appear to be cleaning away quite well. So they are not corrosion by the looks of it, there's something else. Bit of grime around that viewfinder eyepiece. That's hardly surprising. This top cover is cleaning up very well. That'll look fine on the camera. I'll just clean up this top surface. The accessory shoes are not particularly prone to coming loose. But it's always worth checking just to make sure that the screws are tight. And the four screws that hold that block to the top cover. That all appears good. The frame counter dial is often somewhat dirty, as it's um, it's open open to the fingers open to the atmosphere there's often a degree of grime on that number wheel and I usually just go around it with a cotton bud moistened with a little bit of naphtha and give those numbers a bit of a wipe don't use anything too aggressive in the way of a solvent because if you take the paint off there you're not going to like the results I think that's it. Bar a bit of uh, clean.
cleaner. Let's have a look at this frame counter. Let's wipe off that dirty old grease. Check that it moves smoothly. It certainly does. <laughs> That's all good. So I've got to clean the eyepiece and the window here, the scale window for the meter, I will wipe that with glass cleaner gently inside and out. Um, it's a bit grimy on the outside. I'll do that last of all before I fit that to the camera. Which brings me back to dealing with this viewfinder assembly. Which I've got carefully wrapped up here in a tissue. Now the screen is just a mass of mildew spots. So it's got to come apart to clean that up. That's very distracting, those spots, because they are at the plane of focus. So you, your eye is very aware of the presence. Bad patches of silvering in the prism, by example, um, are less of a nuisance often because they are out of your area of focus. And you can see here, there's a big mark around there, around that rubber pad, and there's a big mark here. Now that's where that um, coating and the silvering underneath it have decayed. Where that started on the outside or the inside, who would know, but probably on the outside. So that means that uh, there will be bad spots in the prism at that point. If the screen was good, I would not disassemble this at all because the chances of doing damage to your silver coating with an old prism like this disassembling the finder is fairly high. So if you don't want to invite trouble, leave it alone. Only delve into it if there's a real need to where the potential benefits more than outweigh the possible harmful side effects, if you like. And this, if the prism's ruined and you don't have another prism to replace it, that's a fairly serious side effect. All right, so this is taped on. Now the tape is here is to keep dust out of the prism definder assembly. And This is, having been here for 60 odd years, the adhesive's given way, it doesn't really hold anything. So I lift off my prism. And you can see immediately there, that's where the silver's gone. And on the opposite side, I said there was a spot there too, You'll see, you see that right there. And there's another patch. Now I'm only seeing the reflections, the two patches reflecting from the opposite surfaces. When I look through the prism, I'm not particularly aware of those problems. I can see them if I look for them, but they don't immediately draw my eye. So this finder assembly, what have we got? Well, at the top, starting at the top, we've got retainer clips. Now there'll be two or three retainer clips spring loaded holding the condenser in at the top. One, two, three. To be three. Now the condenser at the top is biconvex, and as far as I'm aware, that's symmetrical. I've always treated it as symmetrical, so it better be. Underneath that, we have this separator. Now one side's got a steeper step on it, a taller step than the other side. The one with the tall step 
goes downwards. It holds the other condenser lens, the Plano convex lens in place. I did one of these cameras recently, or another reflex, where this was an upside down. As a result, the, the condensers weren't held firmly, um, they weren't supported, they were rocking, and because it was misassembled, there wasn't room to put all the clips back in place, so it only had one clip instead of the two or three it should have had. And that finder was a bit of a mess. So we're down to this. Now here we've got three components because there's a little mask in here which I'll just lift out. There's a mask and that sits underneath the Plano convex condenser. It separates that component from the ground glass screen under here. Now immediately under here is the ground glass screen. Now that shiny side up, ground glass side down. At the bottom we have the plastic component with the split image in it for the rangefinder, the split image. Now that split image faces upwards. So the split image and the ground glass, those two surfaces are at the same plane. If you assemble this stuff back to front, it doesn't go well. The plastic lens here, the plastic component with our condet with the split image in it is located with six tiny grub screws. And those grub screws are used to adjust the position of it so that you end up with your prism neatly in the centre of that circle on the ground glass. Because it's very distracting if you've got it off to one side. It doesn't really affect the function, but it doesn't look good. So I'm just backing these screws off one turn. These screws were locked in with a touch of lacquer, but you don't usually have to do anything to free them up. Okay, so I've backed all the screws off one turn. This stuff should pop out now. Here we go. There's my plastic component with the split image rangefinder thing on it. Now the surface with those dots on it. I'll see if I can get that in the light where you can see it. You might need something dark behind it. That's covered with little dots of mildew. Here's the ground glass. Now that ground glass surface there, the, the dull side if you like, that's got the mildew spots on it. This I can clean with glass cleaner. This I'll clean suspended in the ultrasonic cleaner. The plastic is very, very delicate. It scratches very easily. I do not clean these with glass cleaner and or anything and cotton buds. Cotton buds will scratch it. And you don't want scratches on it, particularly at the plane of focus. They become very distracting. So this I'll suspend in a clip and I will clean that in an ultrasonic cleaner in just uh, a little bit of normal dish soap, which over here is, is sunlight or palm olive and I don't know what you use in other parts of the world, dawn, something like that. All right. That's the next part for me anyways, cleaning that up. The fun comes in putting all this stuff back together. Once you've got it clean, you've got all of these surfaces that you're trying to keep dust free while you stack them one on top of another. And it is virtually impossible to avoid getting some dust trapped in there. Which is one of the reasons that you don't pull anything like this apart just to chase the small dust speck. You, you'll go crazy. Use your best skills and you'll you have two dust specs by the time you put it back together.